Okay. Welcome everyone to the Sydney CPPC seminar. So today's speaker is Vasudev Vasgupta. Vasu did his PhD at the Tata Institute in 2009 under the supervision of Amol Diegel. And then he went on as a postdoc to Germany, to Munich, actually, and worked with Georg Raffert there, moved further to Ohio State University, and then to ICTP in Trieste. And since 2014, He's um, a faculty member at the Tata Institute. Basu's main expertise, or his really strong expertise, is fast flavor, uh, basically flavor oscillations, neutrino oscillations in, in the supernova. And that's what he will be telling us to, today about fast flavor oscillations beginning and end. Yeah. Please, Basu. Thanks, uh, Mike. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, very nice. Uh, it's a new set of uh, faces, mostly. So I don't know many of you. Uh, it's, uh, it's very nice to get acquainted with all of you. Uh, please uh, do feel free to ask questions if I you know, don't explain anything uh, clearly. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've done in the last few years. Uh, so the title here is fast flavor oscillations, beginning and end. Okay. So let's start with something that's painfully familiar to all of us for the last three years, uh, the phenomenon of exponential increase of something. Uh, so I'll not talk about the dreaded word here, uh, but uh, I think uh, we all appreciate by now that there are a lot of things uh, uh, that grow exponentially. So human population grows exponentially. Um, transistors on a chip, uh, they have been growing exponentially uh, for several decades now. When a fire spreads, uh, that also grows exponentially. It's much of a trick again. And uh, chain reactions very famously grow exponentially. So all of these are very interesting examples. And in each of them, there is some uh, very uh, important uh, to focus on. Um, but uh, I wish to focus today on the phenomenon of exponential growth of neutrino flavor oscillations. So this is an unusual thing. That's, I, I'll show you why this is unusual and why this does not happen all the time everywhere. But it, it can happen inside supernovae and perhaps a few other environments. Uh, uh, so what you should be looking at here uh, on the x-axis is time in nanoseconds. Uh, I've used reasonably, uh, you know, uh, like reasonable parameters for the neutron masses, energies, and what have you. And on the y-axis is the fraction of flavor conversion on a log scale. Uh, so of course. At t equal to zero, there's very little flavor conversion. And you can see that there's this red curve and there's this blue curve. And for the red curve, the flavor conversion goes and saturates at a very small value like 10 power minus five. And that's what happens when the mixing it is itself very small of the order of 10 power minus five or so. But then there's this blue curve where although the mixing is very small, something happens at around 10 nanoseconds or so and you get almost 10% level mixing, maybe even more, okay? And this phase between roughly six and 10 nanoseconds, uh, it's a roughly linear growth on a log plot. So it's an exponentially rising flavor instability. Uh, and this is what I'm gonna talk about, that what really causes the difference between the usual a red curve and this more exotic blue curve that I'm showing you. Uh, and uh, what, what's the final impact of such unusual flavor oscillations? So if you uh, haven't heard of neutron oscillations, mixing angles, what have you, uh, don't worry, I will try and give you a very quick primer on them. Too. All right, so let's get started. So, but before we get started, just a little bit of motivation. So why do we care about uh, neutron oscillations inside super? and their exponential rise. So first, from a more practical and more application-oriented point of view, uh, neutrinos affect astrophysics, okay? So the heating of a star 
you know, typically a supernova, depends on how energy is apportioned between the different neutrino pairs. So there are lots of neutrinos inside a supernova, and these neutrinos do transport, energy transport, and which flavors have how much energy, uh, that changes how the star evolves. So therefore, it's important to know uh, neutrino oscillation physics uh, if you want to understand supernovae very well. Uh, very interestingly, formation of chemical elements, both inside supernovae and inside uh, neutron star mergers, mm -hmm. the kind that were observed uh, in 2017 by uh, LIGO and follow-up uh, astronomical observations, uh, in these environments, uh, heavier nuclear elements are created, uh, let's say iron and beyond, uh, and the abundance of these R process elements and depends again on the abundance of electron neutrinos and anti neutrinos in the stars. So, if you want to compute and understand uh, how these heavy elements were produced in the universe, it is important to understand neutrino oscillations in those environments. And then, of course, uh, we expect that uh, we will be able to observe. Uh, the explosion of a supernova in our galaxy, in which case uh, we will also observe lots of neutrinos from them. And in order to understand uh, the neutrino properties and other uh, information that's encoded in the supernova neutrino signal, it will be important to decrypt the signal by our knowledge of neutrino oscillations. Okay. So we want to understand how supernovae explode, we want to understand how elements are created, and we want to understand neutrino oscillations uh, from supernovae. For all of these things, uh, we want to understand uh, these complicated, uh, exotic, uh, fast flavor oscillations, and collective oscillations of neutrinos. So that's half my motivation. The other half is a little bit more theoretical. So for the theorists among you, especially if there are any condensed matter theorists around, uh, we could think of the problem as follows. What we have usually for neutrino oscillations is an equation like this, where some state evolves in time with some frequency, which is the oscillation frequency. This problem is a single particle quantum mechanics problem, single state quantum mechanics problem. The problem that we will consider involves a generalization of this to the equation below where instead of just this omega oscillation term on the right hand side, we have something a bit more complicated, but let me parse that for you a little bit. What it has are the density matrices of all the other neutrinos. So new I is the neutron that I'm interested in, and new Js are all the other neutrinos, and I have their density matrix here, and the density matrix acts like a Hamiltonian on this, neutrino that I am focusing my attention on. But all these neutrinos, these J neutrinos, are summed over one to N in some box of volume B. It comes proportional to the Fermi constant F. And there is this additional factor of one minus the cosine of the angle between the two neutrinos. So this neutrino I and neutrino J have, they're traveling around along the directions P I cap and pj cap. So these are the velocities. So you can imagine that these neutrinos are free streaming and they don't change their velocities at all. So they always travel along straight lines. And then the dot product between the velocities is the cosine of the angle between the trajectories. And one minus cosine theta, this factor appears here. So this is a complicated looking term, but the important thing to note here is the following, that there is sum over all the momentum modes that are inside this volume V, which couples the evolution of this ith neutrino to the evolution of all the other neutrinos, because even these neutrinos are oscillating. So there's a, a tower of equations for each momentum mode, and they all need to be solved together. Now, this is a significantly more complicated problem than the you know, former. This is a single uh, equation. This is n equations. That's hard. Uh, and so we'll get to that, but already we can ask some 
very uh, theory oriented questions that is it possible that uh, the oscillation frequency changes from what it was and how does it depend on this number n in fact is it possible that it stops depending on this omega oscillation entirely and just becomes something that's linearly proportional to it? because this term uh, will be of dimensions frequency and so maybe we can just get something that's just totally independent of omega oscillations. Now, alarm bells should rise for those who know a little bit of Newton oscillations already, uh, but we'll see that there's actually something that happens. Then we should ask, what would it take to get this truly unusual behavior where the oscillation frequency is effectively linearly proportional to it? And in such cases, what would be its late time behavior? What would happen at the end? Well, these are questions that are not yet answered and we'll try to answer them. Okay, so, so I have two most motivations. The first uh, is a bit more applied, astrophysics oriented. Uh, the second is a little bit more theoretical where I'm interested in the quantum mechanics of the problem, the structure of the problem. All right, so let's start at the beginning now. So we know that there are three neutrinos, nu e, nu mu, and nu tau with their antiparticles. For the purposes of this talk, I will often not distinguish between nu mu and nu tau. And the reason is that inside supernova, the temperatures are such that muons and tauons are usually not produced or not produced in sufficient numbers. So the electron flavors can have charged current interactions and neutral current interactions, whereas the mu's and the taus, they, they have only neutral current interactions. As a result, uh, the mu and the tau flavors behave more or less identically and you can club them in a single bucket. So we will have only electron neutrinos and non-electron neutrinos in our problem. And you know that they have very small masses, a millionth that of an electron. They interact very weakly. And the oscillate, there is a flavor oscillation, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. So neutrino oscillations should be thought of as two level quantum mechanical systems. So this is the equation that they obey. So imagine that each neutron is described by, yes. Is there a question? I guess it's just a glitch, all right. So imagine each neutrino is described by two components. So nu e and nu mu, the two flavor components. And I want to understand how the amplitude of being in each of these components evolves with time. So it's a Schrodinger-like equation. And this part is the Hamiltonian. So the dimension of energy is provided by this delta m squared by 4 e. That's the oscillation frequency. And because these flavor states are not the propagation eigenstates, the states that evolve independently in time, we have this matrix that is not diagonal. The degree by which it is not diagonal is given by the value of this angle theta, which is called the mixing angle. And to solve this equation, what you find is that the probability of being in your original state, let's say you started out by being an electron neutron, which means that at t equal to zero, your wave function would be one zero. Then the probability of being in the original state, it oscillates like this. But it oscillates like this, as a function of the energy E, in fact, higher energies correspond to smaller omega, smaller oscillation frequencies, which is why it has a larger wavelength. And the lower energies shown in blue have higher oscillation frequencies, which is why it has a shorter wavelength. So that's the picture of neutron oscillations that we are familiar with. But for the purposes of my talk, a complementary picture of neutron oscillations will also be useful. And the picture is as follows. I should think of the neutrino flavor in a two flavor scenario as the Z component of a spin that is precessing around the magnetic field B. So I show the spin by this thick uh, green vector and I label it by P sub omega. So that's my spin polarization vector. This has got nothing to do with the spin of the neutrino, by the way. This is just purely a representation. 
I represent the flavor state using a spin-like mathematical uh, object. It's not the spin of the neutrino itself. So this spin, the flavor spin, if you will, starts out by being along the z direction. You know, it has a it has an intercept at z equal to one, and the fact that the Hamiltonian is not diagonal in flavor basis corresponds to this B field having an angle theta with respect to the Z axis. Then we can use our standard undergraduate uh, classical mechanics knowledge to figure out what happens. This green vector would precess around the magnetic field and the locus of the tip of the spin is shown in this uh, green ellipse that I show you here. And the projection of the tip of this polarization vector on the z axis tells you the probability of observing the initial flavor. In fact, at the projection plus one divided by two is the survival probability. So we will use this spin analogy quite a lot. Um, normal neutrino oscillations, each of these neutrinos precesses independently. Okay. This is something that will change later. One more point is the effect of the medium. So we talked about neutron oscillations in vacuum, but when there are electrons in the, vac in the medium, each neutrino can forward scatter of electrons in the background and gain a phase. Now this happens differently for the electron neutrinos and the non-electron neutrinos. And this relative phase affects the flavor evolution, the relative flavor evolution. Okay, so this is something uh, that was worked out by Wolfenstein, Behave, and Spirnov long ago. And we know neutrino physics, what it does is it changes the oscillation frequency. So instead of the oscillation frequency in vacuum, which was this delta m squared by twice e term, what we get is a modified oscillation frequency in matter shown with the subscript M here, which is given by this complicated looking term. And also the mixing angle changes. So instead of theta zero, which was the mixing angle in vacuum, you get this matter modified mixing angle. Now the thing to note here is that the oscillation frequency grows proportionally with density. So for large density, so the, sec the term that appears here is proportional to the Fermi constant times the electron density. And then for large N sub E, this matter, uh, so this uh, oscillation frequency in matter grows linearly with the density, which is just capital N divided by the volume. And so therefore the oscillation frequency grows proportionally with N, the number of scattering centers that are available to you. No, however, so, so that the mixing angle squared, you know, for small theta, this is just theta squared, decreases as one over n squared because there is an n squared in the denominator. So which tells me that in ordinary matter with you know, electrons in the background, if you have a neutrino traveling through a very dense uh, background, Neutrino oscillations are suppressed because although the frequency increases, the extent of mixing is suppressed as one over n squared. In fact, the interesting regime where you can get large flavor conversion is when in this term, the first and the second term cancel each other, which can happen for the negative sign of delta m squared and positive uh, n e, let's say, uh, you can get a cancellation between these terms. At that point, this becomes as small as it can be. And again, here in the denominator, uh, you get a zero in the first term here and sine squared twice theta matter can become order one. So that's the MSW resonance, the Michael smirnov wolfenstein resonance. And that's where large flavor conversion can happen in ordinary matter. But usually with large density, densities that far exceed the scale provided by delta m squared by twice e, you usually get suppression of, of flavor oscillations.
So this paradigm of neutron oscillations in matter, uh, this has been tested, uh, lots of experiments have been done, a uh, lot of progress has been made, uh, but it is incomplete. What I'm gonna tell you in the rest of my talk is that when there are neutrinos in the background, this description is insufficient and more interesting things can happen. So to go there, what we're thinking of is the following. So there is a neutrino and it forward scatters of a background neutrino through these diagrams mediated by the Z boson. Now for such diagrams, these neutrinos don't have to be in their flavor state. They can be in arbitrary linear superposition of flavor states. And this leads to a potential, you know, just like the MSW potential. But this potential is not diagonal in flavor space anymore because these neutrinos need not be diagonal. Okay. So if you ask, could we just include the effect of scattering of neutrinos in exactly the same way as we include the scattering of electrons by just including an MSW potential? The answer is no, we can't do that. The physics is much more complicated. And that's what I'm gonna tell you. So, but before I tell you anything about how we get these answers, let me just tell you what the answer is. What's the phenomenon? So when the density is very high, so we define the density as some potential called mu, which is forming constant times the neutrino density. Let's say this mu is much, much larger than omega. This is what we would call the collective oscillation regime, you know, where collective oscillations can take place. And why do we call it collective? Because what one observes is that neutrinos of different energy, which were previously oscillating at their independent frequencies, natural frequencies, they now all oscillate together at the same frequency. So they're collective which is to say that previously these polarization vectors were precessing at a frequency that was related to their energy. But now when the neutrino density, the background neutron density is large, they all precess with exactly the same frequency. That's what makes them collective. Now, under some conditions, one finds that just like in the ordinary case, this mixing angle theta can be suppressed. And although these collective oscillations occur, the mixing angle is still suppressed. So these are not particularly interesting in some sense. But under some other conditions, initial conditions, one finds that even for arbitrarily small mixing angle, you know, let's set the mixing angle to 10 power minus 20, the flavor conversion can be ordered you know, so there can be large flavor changes, even with small mixing angle. And the frequency of such large flavor oscillations, collective flavor oscillations with large amplitude, they can be of the order of square root of this omega and mu. So the geometric mean of the collective potential and the usual neutrino oscillation frequency, or even linearly proportional to mu with no apparent dependence on omega at all. So it doesn't depend on delta m squared at all. That's bizarre, right? Because if delta m squared were exactly zero, I would be able to redefine my flavor basis such that it coincides with the mass basis and there should not be any oscillations at all. So this should be really surprising and bizarre to anyone, but this is what we see, is that there are fast collective oscillations which occur for vanishing mixing angle, which have no dependence, practically no dependence on delta x squares. So that's the interesting phenomenon that I'm going to tell you fast collective oscillations. 
So, but there are related things as I just told you. So synchronized oscillations are shown here. You can see this is the survival probability as a function of time on the x-axis is omega times t. So this is a dimensionless object. And you can see different frequencies, they're all oscillating together, but the amplitude is you know, something like 0 0.6. I've chosen it to be still sufficiently large uh, such that you can see these oscillations. If I make the mixing angle smaller by let's say choosing a large background density, then the amplitudes just become very small. And these synchronized oscillations, although they are collective, do not play a big role. However, the second kind are called slow instabilities. Instabilities because they occur even for small mixing angles. Even if you set the mixing angle to zero to the limit of zero, they have this weird pattern, but the, but the wavelength of these oscillations is square root omega. So this was worked out in the mid 2000s. Uh, uh, Yvonne is here. Uh, she did this very interesting work. Today's topic is something a bit more dangerous than that. Where you, exactly the same thing happens, but with no dependence on omega. And these are much faster because mu is much, much larger than omega. So while these take place over kilometers, these oscillations take place over millimeters. Okay, so this can be very dangerous inside a star. So just the last slide contrasting uh, what happens for ordinary neutron oscillations and collective neutron oscillations. So you're familiar that for ordinary neutron oscillations in vacuum, let's say, the survival probability behaves like this, one minus sine squared twice theta, sine squared, delta m squared t divided by four t. So at the beginning, so take the limit of t goes to zero, and for small theta, we are mimicking a large background density here, take the limit of theta also very small, the survival probability initially looks like one minus theta squared t squared. So it vanishes, the so flavor conversion vanishes quadratically in the mixing angle theta. And it grows with time only quadratically with t. And at late times, we know what happens to this. We can take the sine square delta m square t over 4e term and average it over a small region of energy, the energy resolution of my detector at large t and I'll get a half. And so there is net flavor mixing, which is one minus half sine squared twice theta. For the collective oscillation case, all of these things break down. First of all, it can rise exponentially in time, and I'll show you that. It does not seem to depend on the mixing angle at all. In fact, it survival probability is different from one, even in the limit theta goes to zero it has no apparent dependence on delta m square at all. And so we ask the question, what is behind this weird instability? And let's say we figure all of that out, we would be interested in the question, what happens at the end, at late times? But unfortunately, we don't have an analytical answer. So we can't easily predict the degree of mixing, which is what is essential for all phenomenology. So we need to figure out some trick to get an answer which is roughly similar. Uh, and then we would want to know what does this final flavor mixing depend on? So that's what the rest of this topic is about. Uh, so let's get started. So collective instability, so that's the end of my introduction. And now I enter the main body of my talk. So fast flavor oscillations, beginning and end. So let's talk about the beginning at the beginning. So collective instability, what starts it? So this is the actual equation that we need to solve. So this is the density matrix describing the neutrinos. I have to do it momentum mode by momentum mode. I'm working in a fluid picture. So in each little volume of phase space, this density matrix is changing with time and as a function of space, sorry, this should have been an X, so it's, it's the spatial derivative, and this is the velocity of the neutrino. And it changes because of the commutator between the delta m squared term, 
the vacuum oscillations, the term that depends on the electron densities in the background, and then this complicated collective oscillation term, which as I promised has this one minus cosine of the angle between the momentum modes and sum over all the momentum modes. And so it's a complicated problem because it's a seven dimensional partial integral differential equation, you know, three momentum variables, three spatial variables time, and there are three frequencies in the problem. The ordinary neutron oscillation frequency, omega, the size of the electron matter effect, which is lambda. We will not talk about this very much. And the size of the neutrino matter effect, the collective potential, which is mu, which is proportional to the neutrino density and the Fermi constant. And the physics will mostly depend on omega and mu, but largely mu. In fact, I'll show you that it basically only depends on mu. So now the next thing that I'll do is I'll prove for you that fast flavor instabilities occur only under some particular condition. And this condition is that the initial momentum distributions of the two flavors cross each other at some moment. So let's focus on this picture here. These are the three momentum coordinates. So choose any point in space inside, let's say the supernova. And at that point, plot the difference between, let's say the new E and the new mu as a function of the three momentum coordinates. When this object, the difference between the phase space distributions is positive, which is to say that there are more electron neutrinos, paint those regions blue. And when you have more muon neutrinos than electron neutrinos, let's paint those regions red. The boundary of this region, you know, of the red and the blue regions, the interface, is where the distributions cross each other. And what I'm showing here schematically is that for large energies, for large modulus of P, so Px squared plus Py squared plus Pz squared, that's energy squared roughly for small masses, you have more muon neutrinos. That's understandable because muon neutrinos have only neutral current interactions. They escape the star deeper and they have higher average energies. So at very high energies, you will have more muon neutrinos than electrons. So you can get a crossing like this. My claim is that in order to get collective flavor instability, you need such a sign change for the difference of the flavors. And similarly, you can do this for the antineutrinos. In the second picture, I'm showing you something different. Here, in some particular direction, let's say the x direction, you have more muon neutrons than electron neutrons. So imagine that I'm standing about a meter away from the point at which neutrinos are escaping the star. The muon neutrinos have decoupled completely. So their momentum distribution would be more forward peaked. Whereas the electron neutrinos have more interactions, you know, charge current interactions, and their angular distribution would be more spherical, more isotropic. So they would not be as forward peaked. I can therefore imagine that for sufficient overall luminosity of muon neutrinos, I will have an excess of muon neutrinos in the forward direction and an excess of electron neutrinos in the other directions. Again, the interface of these two regions will have the two phase space distributions being equal. And that's what I call a crossing. And this is what I claim is necessary for fast collective instabilities. So the operative object, so the object of interest is the difference between the phase space distributions of the two flavors. And then there are some prefactors which you can forget about. And this, this, this difference is what I call G sub omega, the G sub gamma, and gamma is just the coordinate describing the phase space. Okay. And 
And what I claim is that if you have collective instabilities, G sub gamma must have both positive and negative sign as a function of gamma. So that's, 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 the, that's the claim. And then there's a proof that I'll give you. Uh, so here's the proof. It's a little uh, uh, cumbersome, uh, but it's not particularly difficult. So I'll not go through all the details of the proof, but I'll just give you a sketch of what's going on in the proof. So the equation of motion that I had written down for you, you know, uh, that is something like this, that there are derivatives of the density matrix that depend on the commutator uh, with the Hamiltonian. And then there, I also added the collision term for good measure. You take the density matrix and linearize it around the diagonal and you focus on the off-diagonal object, this capital S, which comes multiplied by the difference of the phase space distributions. You plug this into the equations and what you find is that it obeys a linearized equation of this kind, where S sub gamma, you know, derivatives acting on it, depends on whatever else is on the right hand side. And you ask, when can S sub gamma increase in time exponentially? So what you do is you write it in terms of Fourier modes, e to the power i k0 t minus k vector dot r. And you ask, when can this k0 become complex? So you plug this Fourier answers back into the linearized equations. And you find that allowed solutions of k0 and k, the dispersion relation, are given by the determinant of some matrix called pi vanishing. And this pi is given by this. And pi includes this g sub gamma inside, which was the difference of the phase space distributions. So if we want K0 to be complex, which is to say that there's an imaginary part uh, to the frequency, which is what would lead to exponential growth of the of diagonal element of the density matrix, which is an instability. In the limit, the mixing angle is zero, which we've already set to zero. In fact, we will also set uh, the delta M squared to zero here. This K0 will be complex and it will solve the dispersion relation if determinant of this matrix pi, which is given by this complicated looking object, which is an integral over the difference of the phase space distributions, is equal to zero. And this G of gamma has both sides. So this is the proof by contradiction. What you do is you take this K and you write it as a real and imaginary part. And you assume that this k0 solves the equation. So that, that pi is 0. So determine the pi is equal to 0. But you take this pi and you separate it into its real and imaginary parts. And you diagonalize the part that involves this sigma. And it has this form. And then you do a little bit of uh, algebra and what you find is that in order for this solution to be valid, this the diagonalized version of this n tensor must obey this equation, where the mod square of something times the diagonal elements of this four by four matrix sum up to zero. But note this object. You know, if G omega, G, G gamma has always the same sign, everything else here always is of the same sign too. So this equation cannot be satisfied if G gamma always takes either positive or negative sign. They have to take both signs in order for this equation to be valid. So in summary, what happens is that you linearize the equations and you ask for exponentially growing solutions of the of diagonal element of the density matrix. And what you find is that for such solutions to exist, the difference of the phase space distributions must take both positive and negative sign 
over the phase space. And that's the proof. Now you could ask, does this really happen? And the answer is very likely. So as I told you, new E's have the largest cross section because they have charge current interactions with electrons. New E bars have the next largest cross section and the non-electron flavors have only neutral current cross sections. So what you expect is that the new E's are emitted from furthest out in the star and they have the lowest average energies. Whereas the non-electron flavors have the highest average energies, there is naturally a crossing of the energy spectra, you know, between this blue curve and the green curve. If you will. Similarly, the electron neutrinos decouple last and the non-electron neutrinos decouple first. So at some point in this decoupling regime, if you look at the relative angular distributions of the flavors, what you find is that the electron neutrinos, again in blue, are more isotropic, whereas the non-electron flavors, let's say this green one, are more forward peaked, you know, away from the center of the star, and their distributions will cross here and here. So these crossings of the phase space distributions are what will cause the fast instabilities that I talk about. So in, in particular, what one can show is that when the crossing is in the angular distribution, that leads to a fast instability. And when the crossing is in the energy distribution, that leads to a slow instability. And then the slow ones grow as square root omega mu, the fast ones grow as linear in mu. And the reason is again simple, because what you show is that in basically in this proof, if you set this omega e, which is the oscillation frequency to zero, you can repackage all of this to show that the crossing needs to be in energy. It needs to be in the angles only in G, because you can do the omega, in, the gamma integrals over e squared dE, because nothing here depends on e up if you take this omega e out, whereas all other instabilities depend on e. So basically what a little bit of work shows is that crossings in the energy distribution lead to slow instabilities and crossings in the angular distribution lead to fast instabilities. So this is a cartoon of what happens in a supernova. So the neutrinos are trapped in the core first, and then they escape in a flavor dependent way. So the non-electron flavors decouple first, and then the electron flavors. In this decoupling region, we expect them to have different angular and energy distributions. So we expect fast oscillations here okay, and the color. And then once they start free streaming and they escape the star, all the ordinary neutron oscillations like MSW effects and vacuum oscillations will occur. But nucleosynthesis and stellar heating happens here, you know, in this range of 10 to 100 kilometers from the center of the star. And these can therefore be affected by fast collective oscillations where, which occur before any of this happens. Okay, of course, neutrinos being detected on Earth could also carry some imprint of these fast collective oscillations. So I've told you how neutron oscillations, these fast collective oscillations begin. They begin as an instability that's created only in the presence of the crossing of the phase space distributions. Now let me uh, do the last part of my talk, which is how do these fast flavor instabilities end? What's the end result? What's the equivalent of the half sine squared twice theta? Well, for slow oscillations, we know uh, what, uh, what to do. There are even analytical solutions where what happens is that around the point at which the energy distributions cross, you exchange the occupations of the flavors. So this leads to what are called spectral swaps. So you see, instead of this dotted black 
spectrum and the dotted red spectrum around the crossing point here, the red and the black spectra get exchanged and that's what's called a spectral split. And this can happen either at one location in the energy distribution or at multiple locations. Uh, and that's basically the end result of slow collective oscillations. But what about fast collective oscillations? This was not an easy problem. And in general, we don't know the answer yet. Only for very special cases, so here is one case where we have an analytical solution, where you assume that there are only four momentum modes, you know, shown here, in which case you can write down the equations for the four modes, and you can massage these equations to get equation for the sum of the four modes, you know, which is given by the second order differential equation, which derives from this Lagrangian, and you identify a potential in this Lagrangian, so kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And the potential energy looks like this red curve is the cosine of the angle between the beams is positive. And it looks like this bump if the cosine of the angle is negative. And you start at this point. So when the cosine is positive, what it means is that the system rolls down this potential and oscillates in here. And this is what is seen as fast collective instabilities. That there's a tendency to you know, roll down this potential. Whereas if the cosine is negative, you just keep sitting here and there's a barrier. You don't you know, go over the barrier, there is no level conversion. So fast collective oscillations happen or not happen depending on a sign change. And the sign change is related to the crossing again of the occupation number of the various modes. And in this particular case, because we have a Lagrangian and the second order differential equation, we can solve the problem in terms of Jacobi elliptic functions and we know what happens at the end. But it's still too complicated, it's still too complicated. We would like an understanding of what happens to the flavor composition at late times. So what we do is we just solve the problem numerically. We do it in one plus one dimensions, so one space and one time dimension and a spectrum of momentum modes. So this is only one coordinate in one dimension and that's the velocity along the x-axis. And we choose you know, all possible velocities labeled by this number v. And you can think of this as the projection of the radial velocity. The blue arrows show the electron neutrinos again, and they are more isotropic. Whereas the green ones are the non-electron flavors, which are more forward peaked. And then there's a crossing. And we assume that neutrinos are emitted at each point inside this simulation volume with this difference of occupation numbers. So there's the spectrum, which is the difference of the phase space distributions and you solve this equation in one dimension. So this is the equation to solve. So you solve this numerically, and this is what you see. So you have space along the vertical axis here and time along the horizontal axis. Initially, everything is, is in its original state. So the blue color is no flavor conversion has occurred. And after a few picoseconds, there's a tendency for all of these flavor spins to fall away from the vertical and reduce their Z component, which is to say that there is flavor conversion. And you can see that this happens more or less coherently a few times. So the first two, maybe three oscillations, there is a coherent fall of probability away from one, you know, shown by these white curves, which says that basically that these polarization vectors are roughly speaking, reach the transverse plane. So the survival probability is close to half in this case. But then after a few oscillations, things just get completely jumbled up. This, there's this very weird uh, turbulence-like uh, thing that we can see. And this is decoherence. And we need to understand this now. 
The reason why this happens is that the difference in flavor, which was initially very, you know, if you took the Fourier transform of the difference of flavor as a function of the spatial coordinate, it would only have low Fourier modes. You know, it's very smooth. Over time, the higher Fourier modes get excited, and that's what's shown here. So the x-axis is the Fourier mode, and the y-axis is the amplitude in the Fourier mode. The different colored curves are different time slices. So at t of 0.5, you have this orange curve, which you can see that mostly all of the stuff is at k of roughly 8 or something. And then initially its amplitude grows until about t of 2.5, which is this green curve, at which point something happens. And you start populating all Fourier modes in a cascade. And this transports the difference of flavors to very small spatial scales. Large k corresponds to small spatial scales. So the flavor composition becomes very granular, very glitchy, and that's what's seen here. But the same thing also happens in velocity space. So what's shown here as a function of time is the amplitude in the nth multiple moment of the velocities and the lighter colors are the higher multiples. And what you can see is that at later times, the lighter colors are peaking one by one. And that's because one can show again that these multiple moments obey an equation like this, which you can derive, which is a diffusion equation. And it starts by having a lot of power in the low end multiples, which is here, but then that diffuses to the large n multiples for this equation. So again, difference in flavor composition diffuses to smaller velocity scales. So together, all of these things lead to the relaxation of the problem and the different polarization vectors that go and settle down at their some asymptotic values at late times. So let me not uh, go into these details here. Uh, but one can do this for a large variety of cases, and one finds that eventually the flavor composition settles down at some value. You know, exactly like in the ordinary oscillation case, where oscillations stop and you get some time independent flavor conversion, which is one minus sine squared two theta divided by two. Except that now, predicting this final level of flavor mixing is really complicated. You don't have an analytical solution. Uh, but it turns out that you can do it. So I will not go through this uh, calculation. Uh, what I show here is for a variety of cases, uh, the blue dots for a variety of initial conditions are the final level of flavor mixing. And the blue solid curve is something that's analytically predicted by our uh, paper in our paper, and you can see that it you know, beautifully agrees. Okay, so one can predict this final level of flavor mixing. Okay, and it's again shown in this way as a function of, let's say, the velocity, this one minus survival probability, which is a conversion probability, is basically half for the velocities that are going inward into the star, and then they decrease like this. The solid curves are numerical simulations, the dashed curves are our theory. And for modest values of A, which is the asymmetry between the new E's and the new E bars, in nature, we expect this number to be around 0.2 to 0.4. Uh, we get very good agreement. Okay. So the last physics point that I want to make here is that some people might be a bit worried that how do I get an irreversible final steady state solution starting from equations that are completely reversible. Okay, this equation, for example, is a completely time reversible equation. Now, I should not be able to get a you know, time irreversible answer out of it. 
if you're familiar with uh, the H theorem and Lockschild's paradox in statistical mechanics, this is a problem of similar flavor. And the answer is that we are looking at a coarse grained version of the problem. That because we are discretizing the problem in space and in velocity, we are looking at a coarse grained version. Now, for example, if you toss a coin, if you toss it at very small angular velocity or very small linear velocity, it will always turn up on its original side. If you give it a little bit of angular velocity or initial velocity, it will flip over only once. And so these colored hyperbola here show you the number of times the coin flips. However, if you don't have enough precision in omega or initial velocity v, you smear over this square and you get the, you know, some sort of an average of heads and tails, which is what leads to this probability of half. And that's, the, that, that's how you lose information. In this case too, because we are going to coarse grain over space and over velocities, we are going to get the irreversible answer. So that, that's the physical mechanism by which you get dephasing or depolarization in this problem. Okay, and so finally, let me just end with last two minutes. Why do we care? Because neutrinos can be observed. And uh, let's just skip over a bunch of things. Uh, uh, neutrinos uh, affect the heating of a star, as I just told you, and let me not go into the details, but just show you this one plot. That if indeed neutrinos convert flavor, the enhancement of heating can be approximately a factor of two. You know, so this solid lines are what happens when this flavor conversion does not happen or happens too late. And these dashed lines are what happens when the flavor conversion happens in the way that I just described. So you can get a factor of two extra heating in supernova, which might be more than what is needed to explain how large massive supernova explode. Uh, the other thing that I told you about is that the abundance of elements depends on neutrino flavor. And the key idea there is that the beta equilibrium between protons and neutrons is decided by the abundance of neutrinos and antineutrinos, electron antineutrons and electron neutrinos, that is. And if you take a bunch of electron neutrinos and convert them into muon neutrinos or vice versa, you shift this beta equilibrium. And that affects the number of neutrinos, the number of neutrons, which is what affects the yield of various R process elements. So this is what's shown here, is that if you have no neutrinos, the abundance looks like this black curve. If you put in the right amount of neutrinos, you get this blue curve. If you have too many neutrinos, you get this red curve. Okay, so the abundance as a function of the neutron number, uh, the neutron number and the proton number changes in some way because of the abundance of neutrinos. But not only do they depend on the total number of neutrinos, they actually depend on the flavor composition of the neutrinos. So what's shown here is that you basically don't change the number of neutrinos, the red, so the yellow and the green curves are the same number of neutrinos, but their flavor composition has been changed. And this FC, this golden yellow color, is the case with fast conversions, where you've basically equilibrated all the flavors. And you can see that for mass numbers 140 and above, there is an enhancement of the abundance of these heavy elements. So again, this might be interesting. This is very preliminary. Um, more work is needed uh, to understand if indeed fast conversions are responsible for the creation of these heavy elements, uh, but this is an interesting area to look at. So let's just uh, wrap up. Uh, in the big picture, uh, what we were interested in is neutrino theory, uh, nuclear astrophysics and supernova theory and neutrino phenomenology, and there are various aspects of it which are affected by fast collective oscillations. You know, we want to know what are the different modes of flavor conversion, when, where, and how they occur, and what are the final flavor dependent fluxes. Uh, how it affects supernova heating, how it affects nucleosynthesis. Uh, I didn't tell you anything about collisions. Uh, 
Uh, and I didn't tell you much about signatures and detectors either, uh, but you know, that's perhaps for another time. Uh, this work was done uh, largely uh, by uh, Shumu Bhattacharya. Uh, he is a graduate student who just uh, finished. And my previous graduate student, Mani Prabhu, who's at Heidelberg now. Um, I didn't have time to talk about the work by uh, these two other very bright students. Uh, I've been supported by these uh, funding agencies, and this is our IT tech support. Uh, without uh, their help, uh, none of the numerics could have been done. So I take this opportunity to thank them. And I leave you with this uh, final takeaway message. I hope to have conveyed to you in my talk that ordinary neutron oscillations changes inside environments where there are lots of neutrons. And it changes because of the addition of this complicated looking term where neutrinos influence each other. This allows fast exponential flavor change. And I had promised to you that I'll tell you about the beginning and the end of this phenomenon. And the first question was, when is this possible? When does it begin? And the answer is that when the momentum distributions of the two initial flavors cross each other. I hope to have conveyed that to you. And the second is, what, what, how does it end? What happens at the end? And the answer is that there is large scale flavor mixing, which eventually results in approximate flavor equilibration, which is what we call depolarization, and that it, and that it can affect the heating of the star and the creation of elements. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Basil. Uh, so it's time for questions. Who would like to go first? Maybe I, I kick us off. I have a very basic question. So if you go back to that slide 13, so in the beginning, uh, when, when you, you mentioned that it's all driven by mu, basically by the term, which is proportional to the neutrino density. So, uh, oh wait, so is it, or maybe it was slightly later. So when you had that equation on the slide? I, I think uh, maybe this one. Yeah, 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 that, that's one, that one here. Yeah, so, so what, what I don't, fully understand yet, or what my question is. So in order to have neutrino oscillations, you, you have to basically distinguish the flavors, right? So, so you need something to distinguish the flavors. So if you, if you switch off the first term, kind of, then you don't have any microscopic distinction of the flavors. If you switch off the second term, you don't distinguish the electron flavor technically from the rest. So how does the third term distinguish the flavors, basically that you can get oscillations just by that term? Exactly. Yes. I, I'm, I, so, uh, so what Mike is asking is that uh, how can you get neutron oscillations without the delta m square? You, know, you should not be able to get neutron oscillations without the delta m square because then all, you know the, 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 the flavor basis and the mass basis cannot be distinguished. And yeah. the answer is that, that that's a very good question. First of all, very insightful. Um, the answer is that indeed, if delta m square were exactly zero. That would indeed mean that you cannot get these oscillations. But for any arbitrarily small but finite delta m square, you can get Newton oscillations because now you can define the two bases to be different and the flavor evolution is unstable. So even if you have a really tiny, tiny, tiny offset of your initial. Uh, mass and flavor basis, this term causes an instability that causes the spin, this flavor spin to fall down. This is what is actually proved in the linear stability analysis. When you set the delta m square term to zero, you set the theta term to zero, and still you find dynamical solutions which grow exponentially in time. And they have a size, the frequency is linearly proportional to the mean. So that's precisely what this uh, linearized solution proves, that it's an instability. Yeah, yeah. And it, yeah. So, so, but you need that off diagonal term, right? So you need that, if I look at your density matrix, that's uh, one Indeed. that. So the question is that how do you start with the diagonal term at all? Yes. Right? So good. So your question is that if S gamma is zero to begin with, 
no matter how much of an exponential rise you multiply to it, zero is zero, right? Good. So this is precisely the point of having this first term. So as long as you have an infinitesimal amount of neutrino mixing provided by this term, that is what generates the S sub gamma initially. In fact, that is what you see here in this, let me show you. So, so the see, final part also has to be proposed. So this to... part, you know, this part that's growing initially, this yes. growth is happening because of that delta M squared term. Once you get to some reasonable size of S sub gamma, because of neutron oscillations, the ordinary ones, the instability takes over. And that's the instability here. Yeah. However, you see, ordinary neutron oscillations would have saturated at like 10 power minus five. But because of the instability, you boost it to order one. Okay, and okay. You need, I need that initial term. But you need yeah. this. So we call these seeds. So you need a seed. And the seed is provided by ordinary neutrons. So that's a very insightful question. Thanks for okay, the Thanks, thanks. I see Bruce has is raised his hand. Bruce. So first, thank you very much for a very informative talk. Could you go to slide 50 where you discussed our process, please? 50. 50, five zero. Yeah, sure. Okay, so Can you like this one better? Uh, no, let's just let's just stick okay. on fifty for the moment. Okay. Uh, so what I understood you to say is that the red and the blue curves give you two different R process paths according to the neutrino density. Yes. Um. But then you were referring to the black as what you have without it. And that part I didn't follow because the black looks awfully like just the locus of stable nuclei. So. No, no, no. So the black is here. Sorry. I there is the black. So you see the blue is here. Oh, uh, I can it's... just, I can just make it out. Okay, fine. Yeah, actually, it's a little bit easier to see in this curve here. Fine. So the log of y as a function of k, you can see that the red is above and the blue and the black. Are you, you, were, you were moving the cursor too quickly for me to follow. And now I understand. I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm it, sorry about that. So it, it, so for a small, a small neutrino density provide, causes some small perturbations to the R, pro, to the R process path in NZ. But if the neutrino density becomes large, the R yes. process path becomes very different. Yes. And then you can see the effect in the abundances as you as you look, and that's what happens in the next slide. That's right. Fine, that's fine, right. fine, 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 fine. That's right. In fact, uh, since you asked this question, uh, let, let's just look at it uh, a bit more. Uh, I really like this uh, plot as well, but. See what happens. If you have more electron uh, neutrinos, let's say, that would push the equilibrium to have less neutrons because the re reaction kinetics then goes towards the right. Less neutrons means less number of heavier electrons. And that's exactly what you see. Okay, so while the n number shifts to the left. So fine. While you show the not this slide, but the subsequent one where you compare with observed abundances, um, I guess I might query a plot like this since the neutron star merger observations have essentially indicated that neutron star mergers contribute to the R process at some level. Yes. And you can debate what the contribution to the R process is from neutron star mergers, but that the contribution is above zero is no longer in doubt. Absolutely. So should not 
any such plot as this take into account the fact that if you're talking about a supernova contribution, you are saying that the R process is two component. So in, in fact, I have an apology to make here. This plot is for merging neutron stars. Ah. I, I kind of switched without uh, uh, warning you about it. Uh, these plots for the nucleosynthesis, I'm always talking about neutron stars. Okay, this is the neutron star mergers. This one I don't remember, I'm sorry, but this one is certainly a new construct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So this is a calculation by Lee and Siegel. It's a recent paper. Uh, they do some calculation for neutron stars where they plug in uh, the neutrino mixing uh, that's roughly consistent with fast conversions. Good. Um, other questions? Oh, I have a question, just a detail. Um, just going back to your slide three where you show the instability. Uh, so I presume uh, S3. I tell think. me when to stop. Uh, yeah, S3, I think. The, the one with, the, you know, kind of essentially flat and then it starts going up. You, you, we looked at that earlier. At the very um, beginning, maybe? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, just, just, yeah, exactly. Uh, just wondering if the this time at which the instability starts, uh, like kicks in, does it, is that related to the delta M square? Like, because you, you need a little bit of mix. You, you have to have some, some, you know, non degeneracy, right? And um, so there can't be like, you know, a zero and then nothing happens and then suddenly something happens. So, so I was just wondering if the onset of the instability is related to the delta M square divide by 2e or something like that? Is that the case? Mm, okay, so I think what Yvonne is asking is that can we estimate the time at which the instability really starts uh, as opposed to the ordinary level of seeding that's provided by ordinary mixing? That's a great question. I don't know the answer. Okay, so yeah, but you haven't tested that. I mean, you can run your simulations and then- I have tried different. looking at it, but, uh, and I don't have an answer, uh, but, right. You know, yeah, but I have perhaps I haven't looked hard enough. Uh, okay, but it's yeah. an interesting question. I think it's worth mm -hmm. uh, investigating. Yeah, like what sets the onset? Uh, yeah. So we have various examples, and I could perhaps go back to some of uh, the work done with, for example, Sagar Iron, which I cite later on, where we discuss that a little bit, but uh, I don't have a crisp answer. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Another question I have is um, that there are a few papers by uh, Baha Balentikin and our head of school actually was a commencement of physicist um, about, you know, going beyond this one particle reduced density matrix mm -hmm. description and um, yes. And they were like solving for n equals twenty or whatever, which is kind of highly unrealistic. But do you have any comments on that? That kind of kind of work yes. and whether yes. that would impact on uh, like any of these conclusions, any of the conclusions yeah. that you're drawing yeah. here based on a one particle description? Again, okay. that's a fantastic question, and uh, you know I, I have uh, taken some time to understand and perhaps even appreciate uh, this work by people who are uh, talking about beyond main field. It's interesting stuff. So let me explain what exactly I think they're doing and uh, why that may be interesting. So the idea is, look at this equation. This should worry any theoretical physicist. This is an equation for some object. You know, we're trying to do quantum mechanics and we have both space and momentum specified. So we are saying that this is a rho at the position x with momentum P. This you know, is not a good specification in quantum mechanics. And you should not be able to specify both the location and the momentum. So what is the sense in which this equation is correct? The sense in which this equation is correct is that you have coarse grain over a de Broglie wavelength. Mm -hmm. So you treat the neutrino as far as kinematics, as far as you know, trajectories are concerned, as classical objects. But you treat their flavor evolution, the internal dynamics, in a quantum mechanical way. 
That's what's happening in this equation. And in order to do that, what's been done is that you've defined this density matrix as the quantum field theoretic average of a dagger for the momentum mode P in some little region D3x. That's what this equation is about. But there are other quantum field theoretic correlations like a dagger B, you know, in you know, fermion antifermion in standard notation. What happens to those correlations, you could ask? And that's the kind of question that would be answered by going beyond the mean field. Mean field means that you're only looking at the quantum field theoretic averages of A dagger A's. And B dagger B's are the robots. But what about A dagger B's? These are helicity changing correlations. And uh, to do that, you would need to go a little bit beyond mean field. But of late, recently, they've been going even further beyond. What they're trying to do sometimes is that they don't want to do any quantum field theoretic averaging at all. They want to do the full quantum field theoretic calculation with all particles, you know, which, which is what would be done in many body uh, quantum uh, condensed matter physics. So things like entanglement and you know, uh, these things become important. My impression is that these I have not seen any place where it makes a really big difference phenomenologically, but that is not to say that someone will not find something interesting later on. So it's theoretically all very interesting and uh, that stuff, but uh, I haven't found phenomenological impact of those terms yet, but it's theoretically very interesting, yes. I hope I was able to say something useful. Uh, okay, it remains to be investigated. I, I guess that's the, the, the point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe they can okay. build a quantum computer to investigate that. <laughs> or good theory, which somehow allows you to extrapolate from mm. n equal to 20 to n equal to whatever, 10 to the 23. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's a hard problem. I, I, I don't yeah. know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, let, let's thank Basu again for a very interesting talk. And I'm sure he's happy to answer more questions, but I, would, I think we should draw the 